Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about a very exciting announcement that we might actually see some kind of a really bright explosion in the night skies in the near future. In other words, even though the star Betelgeuse about which we've talked about very recently is probably not going to go supernova anytime soon, there's at least one star out there that might create a really really bright explosion that we'll be able to see. Let's talk about this unusual star known as V Sagitta and welcome to the math. So yes, unfortunately Betelgeuse is probably not going to go supernova anytime soon, even though it's exhibiting unusual patterns. But there are these unusual stars known as cataclysmic variables that do often exhibit unusual properties and in many cases create really really bright explosions. So first of all, what exactly is a cataclysmic variable? Well, generally speaking, it's two stars, a white dwarf and another star that's usually referred to as the donor. And I think one of the best ways I can probably demonstrate this is by using the nearby Sirius star system. So there are two stars in the Sirius star system. There's Sirius B, which is a very small but very dense white dwarf, which as you can see right here is actually about the same size as planet Earth. But in terms of mass, it's a lot closer to our own sun. But the much bigger star, technically the parent star here, is Sirius A, which is a much, much larger and much more massive star. Sirius B, you can see, is right here where Sirius A is right there in the background. And if hypothetically one day these two stars actually get this close together, which they're not right now, but if they do, they'll become what's known as the cataclysmic variable. Essentially it's a pair between a white dwarf, a very dense uh, star that has a lot of mass all within a very small amount of uh, volume, and a typical other main sequence star, such as usually um, a red dwarf. Now just for fun, let's run the simulation and watch what happens to the larger star as soon as I basically let them orbit around one another. You'll notice that the larger star actually starts sort of um, losing its material and contributing it to the smaller Sirius B that's right there. Also, I actually did this a little bit too fast, so the star ended up going supernova, which it shouldn't. In, um, in theory, this is kind of impossible, but in the simulation, sometimes it does happen. Now, if I try this again, you'll notice that it happens once again, and so a lot of this material is actually now going to be absorbed by the much smaller, but also extremely dense white dwarf right here. And the thing is, as soon as it starts absorbing all of this mass, it actually starts accumulating it around itself, first usually as a kind of an accretion disk, which you can see in this illustration by NASA, and then it also starts absorbing some of this material onto its surface. But when this accretion disk starts orbiting around the white dwarf, at some point, all of this material will actually get so massive and so dense that it can easily initiate a nuclear reaction and create a really, really powerful explosion. Like, we're talking about nuclear explosion, but much, much more powerful than anything humans produced here on Earth. So in other words, pretty much all of these cataclysmic variables exhibit very similar patterns. At some point, all of this mass collects very close to the white dwarf. This is all coming from the donor star, which can be very different. And later on, this accumulates and explodes, creating a really bright and very visible event that we usually refer to as nova. So not a supernova, just nova. There are actually very different cataclysmic variables with very different properties. For the most part, what unites them is the fact that there's a white dwarf and usually some sort of other star, but other things can happen in the middle, or other things can actually lead to this disastrous cataclysmic event. For example, some cataclysmic variables are so powerful magnetically, uh, specifically the white dwarf is so powerful, that it prevents the accretion disk from forming, and instead all of this matter accumulates on the surface and eventually sort of creates a layer around the star itself. In other words, it's as if all of this material will now be deposited onto the white dwarf and create a thick, I guess you can call it ocean of hydrogen and I guess in some sense helium as well, and eventually two things might happen. Either the star itself will become very massive and reach what's known as Chandrasekhar limit. This is the limit that I've talked about previously and we can actually easily demonstrate this here. If I were to give this star right here a mass of just about 1.4 masses of the sun, and this is pretty much true of any white dwarf in the universe, this white dwarf will very likely go supernova almost instantly. So for white dwarf, there's actually a mass limit. So watch what happens right here. Notice how it instantly goes supernova, and we refer to this as type 1 supernova. 
And this is one of the possible resolutions. The other resolution is that um, eventually the matter accumulates to the point where once again it creates just a nuclear reaction, not a supernova, creating once again a nova. So nova and supernova unfortunately have this name that can be kind of confusing, but they do have very different properties. Nova is generally a much smaller explosion, supernova is a tremendously powerful explosion that you see right here on the screen. But now let's actually talk about this unusual star known as V Sagittae. So the thing about that particular unusual cataclysmic variable is that, first of all, it appears to be about 100 times more luminous or brighter than any other cataclysmic variable out there. In other words, this star produces way more light than anything else out there in the galaxy. And we think we understand why. The main reason is because the star that orbits along with the white dwarf is actually about 3.9 times more massive than the white dwarf itself. Now normally, for all of the cataclysmic variables we've seen so far, the white dwarf, despite its small size, is usually the more massive partner. Basically, in most cases, the so-called secondary or the donor star is usually some sort of a red dwarf that's a lot less massive than the white dwarf in the middle. But for V. Sagitta, the story is completely different. Because from what we've observed so far, first of all, it doesn't seem to exhibit any magnetism, so there's probably a very large accretion disk around it, which we can try to simulate right here in Universe Sandbox. Although in reality, it's probably way, way bigger and, and way brighter and also way more powerful. And so as this accretion disk forms, pretty much all of the matter comes from the much larger and very, very massive and bright partner. And because so much energy is generated uh, while this accretion disk is deposited around the white dwarf, we've also realized that it produces a lot of X-ray radiation that we can easily detect from Earth, which is also very unusual for a cataclysmic variable. So this already is a very strange star. Well, what's even weirder is that once we looked at the data from years ago, and more specifically the data collected back in 1890s, over 100 years ago, by the Harvard Observatory, we realized that when looking at the star brightness, it seems to have become about 10 times brighter than it used to be back in 1890s. And at first this was kind of difficult to explain, but a very recent paper demonstrated that what's happening here is that this is a binary system where two stars are spiraling toward each other really fast. In other words, they're coming closer and closer and closer toward one another. And it's basically doubling its luminosity every 89 years or so. Meaning, of course, that um, it's going to get even brighter and brighter, and we're going to be actually able to see it really soon, even with a relatively simple telescope. But that's not everything. Because this is a binary star system and these stars are spiraling toward each other, at some point they're going to reach their limit. And the scientists were able to figure out that this official limit is going to be reached around the year 2083. In other words, if you're going to live long enough, you might be able to see this in the night skies. And according to the researchers, when this star finally reaches its limit, what they believe is going to happen is that all of this mass from the larger star is actually going to be almost instantly deposited onto the surface of the white dwarf. This will generate such a tremendously powerful explosion, or probably basically a supernova-like explosion, that it's going to be visible from pretty much everywhere in the world and will become the brightest star for at least a few weeks, possibly even a few months. Although it's not going to be anything as bright as, for example, our moon, but it's definitely going to be brighter than Sirius and possibly even brighter than Venus um, in the night skies. Now, it's very likely not going to be a true supernova, meaning that the white dwarf will still remain behind, but what it's going to create is going to be sort of equivalent to what you're seeing right here on the screen. Very, very powerful solar winds that are going to be coming out of the star itself, and all of this will be the result of the sudden inflow of mass onto the white dwarf. Basically, it's going to be equivalent to some of the brightest stars, but the real reasons for this brightness are going to be the solar wind, not so much the explosion itself, although honestly, we're kind of still trying to figure out what's really going to happen. And the other mystery or the other question here is, what's going to be left behind after all of this ends? Well, it's likely that the final remnant of this cataclysm is just going to be a very unusual white dwarf with the large thick layer of leftover hydrogen on the surface, the layer that stays behind and doesn't get exploded or gets blown away. In other words, it's going to become a very unusual, very unique star and might actually teach us a lot more about the universe than what we know right now. 
Now all of this is of course still quite far away and obviously most of you, if you'd like to see this event um, happen in real time, would probably have to live at least a hundred years. So this is a pretty good reason to try to become one of the Centennials, basically live to at least a hundred. But on the other hand, uh, the good news is that it might also happen approximately 16 years earlier, or maybe will happen 16 years later. The actual analysis right now is still incomplete, so we're not 100% certain when all of this will actually happen exactly. But for now, the preliminary date is 2083. And interestingly, the last such event that actually occurred and was visible from everywhere was this right here in 1604, this was the Kepler supernova. So in that sense, it's going to be a really exciting time to be an astronomer or to study astronomy because we're going to be able to study something in real time that hasn't happened for several hundred years. So in that sense, as long as everything goes fine for humanity until 2083, it's going to be really, really exciting to look up into the night skies. But for now, that's really all we know. Once we discover more about the more specific date or some other similar events, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. So do subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.